Welcome, Tales of Glory listeners. This is the big episode 7-0. And today, guess what? We're diving back into St. Teresa of Avila, Interior Castle, Six Mansions, Chapter 2. I know our two listeners and our dog producer have been excited to get back into this because we've been doing all sorts of stuff between Fireside Chats and the Book of Exodus, which we need to dive back into too here pretty soon. But it was time to dive back into St. Teresa of Avila. Today, we're going to look at Chapter 2, the Prayer of the Wound of Love. St. Teresa, the Interior Castle, Six Mansions, Chapter 2. Cool stuff today. Very cool stuff. Let's do a quick recap, since it's been a while with the Six Mansions. Teresa devotes 11 chapters to the Six Mansions, by far the longest and most developed section in the entire treatise. In them, she examines a prayer of spiritual betrothal, the mystical state that flows directly from the prayer of union. This stage of soul's inner journey has a lot to do with rarefied mystical experiences such as locutions, visions, both intellectual, imaginative, and raptures. And actually, we'll be covering that one in the next episode with St. Teresa of Avila in Chapter 3. We had a lot of that, but that was our quote from Dennis Billy, Interior Castle, the editor of the classic text with spiritual commentary. Quick recap. So back in the fifth mansions we were in, in these mansions, the fifth mansions, God enters the inner sanctum soul so deeply that when it returns to itself, it has no doubt whatsoever that it shared with God and experienced a mutual dwelling. Again, this is from the commentaries of Dennis Billy. So we're talking about the mystical experiences. St. Teresa keeps calling these things prayer, prayer of, because that's our way of communicating. It takes a while to wrap your mind around it, because when we do prayer, we always think it's like ascetical, one way, like in the first three mansions, right? And from chapters, or excuse me, mansions four through seven, these are mystical experiences where we are communicating through prayer, but instead of us initiating the prayer, God's doing it. God's communicating through prayer and coming to us. That's the mystical experience. So when she talks about the prayer of union, it's actually God initiating mystical prayer and communicating with us. And here she describes uh, he, he penetrates the inner sanctum of the soul so deeply that when it returns to itself, it has no doubt whatsoever that it shared an experience with God of mutual dwelling. Very important right there. So it's not an emotional thing. It's not, it's not we had tears or some, something was triggered by the mind. God triggered it, and it was triggered so deep in the soul that we can't replicate it. In the fifth mansions, we experience a vision of Jesus who promises himself to the soul. St. Teresa used the analogy of a spiritual engagement. So in the fifth mansions, we become, in her analogy, spiritually engaged. Right? We're being prepared for the, the deeper part of what she called the spiritual marriage. Now, this whole thing is an analogy. I know some of these people go off the rock and are like, this is so strange. What are we talking about? Um, engagement, and marriage, and stuff. Well, she's following along the analogies of the bridegroom, like in Matthew. Remember the, the ten virgins and only five virgins made it in with the bridegroom? She's working her way through these analogies in her own way of explaining how God prepares a soul of those five virgins. If you want something to anchor it down to something scripturally, that's what she's looking at. She always referred to scripture. Remember, she was like a romantic poet. And so we have to follow her poetic idioms to unpack these things or decompress them, how they are, however she's encapsulated them. Because it's all through a love language, romantic language she uses. She was romantic at heart. In the six mansions, you have this peace that Jesus has promised to give himself to you. Where did he do that? He gave it, promised to give himself to us in the fifth mansions. So in the six mansions, it's during our engagement to Jesus in the, in the analogy. There are many harsh trials in the sixth mansion, chapter one, and let me tell you, they're going to continue here in chapter two. Jesus prepares the heart and soul for deeper union in preparation for spiritual marriage. How does he prepare the heart? Through trials. Yep, here they come. Jesus wakes up the faculties where in the fifth mansion they were asleep. Mystical experiences in the six mansions. Remember, there were four waters of prayer. Here in the mystical experience, part of the mansions we're experiencing the fourth water. So in Six Mansions chapter 1 it introduces the mystical prayer of betrothal, the engagement. And the fourth water is described as rain. 
It is the highest stage where the soul does not control its senses, ecstasy of prayer, but for a short time it is lost in contemplation and rejoicing. This prayer is generally very short, lasting only a moment or a few minutes at a time. When this happens, we are abiding in Christ in a way that we know but cannot explain. We also have no memory of what happened during this time, whatever we are reading or recalling an event in Christ's life or engaging in vocal power, prayer. Excuse me, in vocal prayer. So God comes in, and he just takes over, and it's it's intimate. It comes in suddenly, and sometimes he takes over so much of the faculties, we can't remember a lot of stuff we were doing or what happened during that time. And this is not transcendental meditation. Let me halt you guys right there. I know there was a, the New Mystics or something that teach people transcendental meditation, and that is so wrong. That is off the rocker of what St. Teresa taught. Which St. Teresa is talking about as God comes into the mind, and that's part of this prayer, this prayer of union, where God comes in and takes over the faculties. Just so he has union with us, right? We submitted ourselves to the point and surrendered our, ourselves to the point where we want our will to be his will, and that's what the union is. So he can come in, right? He has to come in not violating our free will. Our free will said, we surrender to you. Therefore, he can come in and do this with us. And you get that through lots and lots of time, through recollection, practicing his presence, and just developing that relationship, right? She's talking about, this is how you do a relationship. Like, I'm in a relationship, right? I keep using that old lady voice. I'm in a relationship. This is what the relationship looks like. You're spending time, I hate to use prayer closet. That's what we use all the time here too. It's wherever you pray. I mean, I'm, I practice his presence all the time and mental prayer. Whenever I'm driving, going somewhere, you know, or just in my mind, I always talk to Jesus. We have our conversations. It's one-on-one. -on -one. He's always there with me. That's practicing his presence. It's got to be the point where it's just, he's just infused with you. In the Six Mansions, Chapter 2, Jesus wakens the soul with a deeper love. St. Teresa introduces a new prayer to us called the Wound of Love. The prayer of the Wound of Love, it's mystical prayer. It comes from God, right? This is what we call infused prayer or mystical prayer. It comes from God. We don't initiate it. We're not sitting there going, oh, dear God, I want the Wound of Love. And we'll explain what this is in a second. And it's God coming in on his own. He's picking up the phone, calling us, or doing the face. Let me put it this way, more modern time. He's doing the FaceTime with us, literally. He's doing the FaceTime in our mind. He's taking over our faculties and doing things with us, and it's very intimate. So look at this new prayer of love. Remember, if it's a the prayer of the wound of love, that means Jesus is initiating it. It's mystical. So what is the prayer of the wound of love? I think Dr. Lyles from Discerning Hearts Radio at the podcast, Interior Castle, he covered some stuff over the Six Mansions, Chapter 2. And he had this really good analogy I wanted to capture here. What's going on is a movement of the Holy Spirit that's deeper than your intellect, deeper than your imagination, deeper than your affectivity, moving in the deepest core of your being. God brings us into union where he is completely sustaining our existence. So consciously what's happening here, I'm cutting in, this is me, that... We can't live without him. We're constantly practicing his presence, or and we're di we're constantly in with him, having conversations, and we don't know what it's like to live without him. Once you've reached this state, so back to this: our free conscious is dwelling next to God, the seventh mansion. You are not in it yet, but you are so close to it. The movements are so delicate and subtle, and proceed from the depths of the heart. These experiences are difficult to describe. Saint John of the Cross. Call it something very, very powerful, working in a delicate way. Remember, we all talk, talk about, this is me cutting back in again, we always talk about how subtle these mystical experiences are. These are subtle, okay? In the charismatic worlds, we like to be very vocal, and we like to um, be very expressive, like, oh, wow, I'm feeling this now, I'm feeling this. It's not like that. And the mystical experiences, they're not like that. They're very subtle. Sometimes you don't even know you're have, having them, or like, she's, like St. Teresa said, you've already experienced it, and like, Wow, it just happened, but I can't remember exactly the whole thing, what happened, because God did it. But you just remember it. it happened, and it was amazing. So cutting back in. Example, the power of the hands of a surgeon that can do subtle things that can heal someone completely or relieve suffering. There's power in the hands of the surgeon. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in the very depths of our soul. So when we experience this wound of love, God's coming in and fixing stuff in the depths of our soul. 
Remember we went through trials, trials, trials through humility to peel off stuff from us? Now we're at the point now, maybe some stuff's deep and ingrained and he's doing the surgery to remove it from us to bring him, excuse me, to bring us closer to him is what's going on. So back to this with Dr. Lyles. What's going on in this prayer is that Jesus is beginning to heal the deepest parts of these wounds. His ability to that and the way he does it is subtle to us. Again, with the word subtle. It's delicate. We don't notice what he's doing in, while he's doing it because he's so subtle, and that is the prayer is about. She's going to go on and use this image that St. John the Cross used that this subtle movement of Jesus as a kind of a spiritual wound. So it's an image. Again, remember, she's in metaphors. The uh, interior castle is a metaphor of the soul, right? The castle where God dwells is this big, crystal, beautiful castle that emanates light. It's Now it's a very New Age image. We wouldn't use it at all. But back in the 1600s, this was... That's what she recognized that God lived in this way, right? It was a big, beautiful castle. He dwells in the center. His light emanates. And here we have this analogy of the wound of love that she borrowed from St. John of the Cross. But I think she expanded on it. I think hers makes a little bit more sense because she put more details to it. Uh, this is a spiritual wound that Jesus is going to go in and heal the depths of us from. Very beautiful thing. So, in order to describe the wound of love, we need to backtrack a bit and examine St. Teresa's experience with the prayer of the wound of love from Autobiography Life in chapter 29. Remember, the autobiography was now in the hands of the Inquisitors, and it probably pretty much disappeared forever during her lifetime. They couldn't have access to it. So, St. Teresa's confessor at the time said, we need to rewrite this stuff down. And so she put it in third person. You know, like, I once knew this person. Kind of like what Paul said, right? I once knew a person who was pulled up to the third heaven. See where she borrows her stuff from? She borrows it constantly from the Bible. It's cool stuff. So here, she's going to tell us what, what, firsthand her experiences from her book of life that was captured by the Inquisitors. They found nothing wrong with the book either. They finally released it. So there's nothing to be afraid of here. <laughs> this is some cool experiences she had. Remember, we're looking at a map of some, a person who has deep prayer life and what's going on. Let's see what she said about the wound of love. Some cool stuff. So again, we're in uh, her autobiography, Life, chapter 29. And this is about the wound of love vision she had. So um, chapter thir excuse me, um, chapter 29, paragraph 13. These other impetuosities are very different. It is not we who apply the fuel. The fire is already kindled, and we are thrown into a moment to be consumed. It is not by no efforts of the soul, and that... Sorrows are over the wound which the absence of the Lord has inflicted on it. Okay, stop right there. It is by no efforts of the soul and that it sorrows over the wound which the absence of the Lord has inflicted on it. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to this. So God pulls away, right? God comes into our soul and he pulls away. Like, um, is it absence makes fondness? So that's kind of the same thing that's going on here. He makes the soul lovesick. If you want to see what, if we're jumping ahead, I'm going to spoiler alert. He's making, he pulls away and makes the soul lovesick, and it's a wound. Okay, back to this. It is far otherwise, for an arrow is driven into the entrails to the very quick and into the heart at times, so that the soul knows not what the matter with it, nor what it wishes for. <laughs> it's kind of graphic, right in the entrails. Again, she's being metaphorical, right? Because um, she's lovesick, and it's painful. So to us, in this day and age, like the idioms of the back, back in the 1600s, we go like too much information, right? TMI, right? But then she's describing how painful it was for her to have Jesus pull away from her to make her grow more fond and chase him more. Because at this point in love, she was lovesick for him. And it pulled away. It's like somebody just jabbed her in the <laughs> entrails. Oh my goodness, St. Teresa. St. Teresa. Okay, back into this. It understands clearly that it wishes for God and that the arrow seems tempered with some herb which makes the soul hate itself for the love of our Lord and willingly lose its life for him. It is impossible to describe or explain the way in which God wounds the soul, nor the very grievous pain inflicted which deprives it of all self-consciousness that this pain is so sweet that there is no joy in the world which gives greater delight. As I have just said, the soul would wish to be always dying of this wound." It's a love sickness, right? She's love sick and she's enthralled. It's 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 a very and I'm being analogous to using that metaphor, love sick, but that's the only thing I can describe it, what she's experiencing. She so desires Jesus to, to come back closer to her heart 
and he's pulled away and it's just it's because he needs to do this to us for us to trust him see what's going on here so i explained before in spiritual warfare we have to trust god and there's ways he teaches us to trust him if we are working on our relationship with him like she is here and as we go deeper we're surrendering to jesus and we're allowing him to do the work on us what needs to be done to get us where we need to be and sometimes it's painful Sometimes it's painful work to the heart. But as we come out of these every time, these trials, we trust Jesus that much more. And without rabbit trying too much, I think too many people go in for deliverance when they're going through a trial. One, because they don't trust Jesus to work on them. And two, because they don't trust Jesus to work on them. So I think you could probably throw out some uh, quite a high volume of deliverances. You sat down, listened to the person's story, and realized it was Jesus trying to do work with them in a trial. Sometimes he'll allow demonic presences or demonic oppression to do, put them through a trial just so they would trust Jesus. It happens. I mean, we don't preach that in the modern Western church because we don't want to offend people. <gasps> Jesus wouldn't allow that. I mean, Jesus is a warrior. Jesus is going to have to send... We're in Jesus' boot camp right now. We're in the end times. It's like, um, what was it? Suck it up, buttercup. You know, that's pretty much what you're doing. You have to trust Jesus to get through where you're going. Either you will or you won't. The five virgins went through multiple wounds of the heart for prolonged periods of time. The other five virgins didn't because they didn't have the oil. They didn't have the trust. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Let's get back to this. So, Life, chapter 29, paragraph 14. This pain and bliss together carried me out of myself, and I never could understand how it was. Oh, what a sight a wounded soul is. A soul, I mean, so consciousness of it as to be able to say of itself that it was wounded for so good a cause, and seeing distinctly that it never did anything there whereby this love should come to it, and that it comes to from the exceeding love which our Lord bears it. So we didn't do anything to deserve it, right? Back to Jesus Christ on the cross. We didn't do anything to deserve it. But it comes from an exceeding love, the love that went to, to the cross for us. That's the exceeding love. That's where it is right there which our Lord bears. Our God's a loving God. He, he's not going to leave us in this state. And what's happening here is a lot of our stuff, you know, I think psychologists say our personalities are built up over uh, infusions of DNA that go back, like, was it over 400 different personalities or something like that, or traits from our DNA? And if you look at this from... So it's not just a parent shaping a child. We already have stuff programmed into us of how we're going to behave and who we're going to be. That's why sometimes we're angry or sometimes, you know, we have propensity to be bitter because it's it's in our DNA. Um, or as we'd say as a Christian, it's it's part of the original sin. It's cascading down the, the, the tree here. So what the Holy Spirit's doing, he's coming in and he's weeding out some of the original sin that's stuck in us. We were saved from it. But we still have those those traits in us that he has to clean up from us. Because we're mankind. Remember, in, um, was it Genesis 7 or 8 where God said he wouldn't wipe out mankind again? But he, he proclaimed man was inherently evil. It comes from original sin. Back in Genesis 3. And here with the wounds of love, we're going through and allowing Jesus to clean it out for us. And learning to trust him to clean out the wounds that were left in us from original sin. So let's return to this. A spark seems to have fallen suddenly upon it that has set it all on fire. Oh, how often do I remember when in this state these words of David and quinumdum deseret servas fonts I'm not going to butcher Latin. I can't read it. Anyways, go on. They seem to me to be literally true of myself. Paragraph 15. When these impetuosities are not very violent, they seem to admit a little mitigation, at least. The soul seeks some relief because it knows not what to do. Through certain penances, the painfulness of which, and even the shedding of its blood, are no more felt than that of a body were dead. The soul seeks for ways and means to do something that may be felt for love of God. But the first pain is so great that no bodily torture I know can take it away. As relief is not to be had here, these medicines are too mean for such a high disease. So when he pulls away, Jesus pulls away, that's a pain far greater to take. And it's interesting, if you go through this, what she's talking about is the dark night of the soul. That's something Christians throw about, you know, like, I'm going through a dark night of the soul. 
what the dark night of the soul is th through interpretation of St. John of the Cross is what she's talking about, the wound of love. It's when you're in your place of practicing his presence, you're in that part of the relationship where she calls the, the engagement part, where you're like engaged to him and he's preparing you deeper for the spiritual marriage. And he comes into your soul and then he pulls away for a longer period of time. And your soul is just like, oh, it just feels terrible. It, you feel it physically. It's not fun. It, it feels like it feels like a heart condition. It's not a heart condition, if that makes sense. You can physically feel the manifestation of it, like a like a, a pressure or something there. It's not there. It's strange, but it's it's horrible. But you know that's what it is after a while because it doesn't align to a medical condition. It's really strange. And it's a dark night of the soul. It's almost like it's not a depression either. If you mix like a a weight on your heart with a depression, but it's not a depression. That's kind of what she's talking about. But it's that weight she's talking about that no bodily torture I know can take it away, right? Because no medicine will take it away because your soul so longs for Jesus to be close to it. And when it pulls away, it's like this deep, dark, depressive lovesickness. And that's the best way I could describe it. So let's go back to this. Some slight mitigation may be had, and the pain may pass away a little by praying to God to relieve its sufferings. But the soul sees no relief except in death, by which it thinks to attain completely to the fruition of its, go its good. At other times, these impetuosities, I wonder what that word is after I look that one up, impetuosities, are so violent that the soul can do neither this nor anything else. The whole body is contracted, and neither hand nor foot can be moved. If the body be upright at the time, it falls down, as a thing that has no control over itself, it can even breathe. All it does is to moan, not loudly, because it cannot. It's moaning how it comes from a keen sense of pain. So that's the soul and the heart are suffering. It's kind of amazing too. We always say we, we, we always refer to our heart as having emotions, and yet our heart is an organ. But when you do this spiritual stuff like why does the heart ache physically in that area? You know, what's going on here? Is it like a spiritual aspect or attribute where the, it is the heart? Our heart is our life-giving blood. You know, it, it pumps life into us. But also our, our emotions, life for our emotions always feel like, even though they come from the mind, why do we feel the effects on the heart down there too? Interesting stuff. Something we have to ask Jesus, right? That's crazy. Paragraph 16, we're still in the Book of Life. Our Lord has was pleased that I should have a time, a vision of this kind. So he's having a vision now. I saw an angel close by me on my left side in bodily form. This I am not accustomed to see unless very rarely. Though I have visions of angels frequently, and I see them only by an intellectual vision. We haven't covered that yet. That's going to be in Six Mansions Chapter 3. But if you're familiar with the podcast, I cover this quite a bit because I experienced one of these too. An intellectual vision is where you feel it. You feel the presence. So here we go. Yet I see them only by intellectual visions, such as I have spoken of before. It was our Lord's will that in the vision I should see the angel in this wise. He was not large, but small. So she's getting an intellectual vision and an imaginative vision right now, because she's seeing it, right? But she's not seeing it with her eyes, not a corporal vision. She's seeing it in her mind. So here she goes describing him. He was not large, but of small stature, and most beautiful, his face burning as if he were one of the highest angels, who seem to be all of fire. They must be of those whom we call cherubim. Their names they will never tell me, but I see very well that there is in heaven so great a difference between one angel and another, and between these and the others that I cannot explain. Paragraph 17. I saw in his hand a long spear of gold, and at the iron's point there seemed to be a little fire. He appeared to me to be thrusting at times into my heart, and to pierce my very entrails. <laughs> she goes again when he drew it out. So I guess he's jabbing it down through his heart through the entrails. I guess it's the way you drive a, a, a spear into somebody, right? We don't know that anymore. From the heart through the entrails. That's why she keeps using that. And when he drew it out, he seemed to draw out them out also and to leave me all on fire with the great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan, and yet so surpassing was the sweetness of the success of pain that I could not wish to be rid of it. Again, this is her, her analogies, right? She's not in this horrific pain. She's talking about the pain of the of the lovesickness, right? The pain of her heart, feeling God pull up, pull away. So it's not this horrific pain. She needs to go see the doctor or something like that. She's she's it's a metaphor. 
She's explaining something using her words, right? She's a poet. She's a romantic poet. Except she used the word entrails. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that was okay back then. Let's continue. The soul is satisfied now with nothing less than God. The pain is not bodily, but spiritual. Though the body has its share in it, even a large one, it is a caressing of love so sweet, which by now takes place between the soul and God, that I pray God of his goodness to make him experience it with who he may think that I am lying. Paragraph 18. During the days that this lasted, I went about as if beside myself. I wished to see or speak with no one, but only to cherish my pain, which was to me a greater bliss than all created things could give me. So she's walking around the spiritual state, right? It's still, it's still resonating with her. And like I said, these, these things can last. It's instantaneous, but what she's talking about afterwards can last for months. So you have this thing where God um, hits you with this, what she calls this, this wound of love vision, right? It's instantaneous. He comes in, it's like ravages the heart and then moves off and he pulls away. Yet if you practice his presence, you still talk to him, but you don't feel the closeness, right? He's doing this thing where he's right there with us. We didn't really leave us, but it feels like we can't get close to him internally. It's really an odd feeling. And meanwhile, he's still doing all this stuff with us. He's still speaking with us, and we're still communicating through prayer. So many mystical experiences. But like the the heart is just yearning, like, oh, I need you back in me, God. I need you back in me. He still is, right? It's just it it's 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 forcing us to chase him deeper during these times and during these trials. And we'll probably get this too. There's also trials associated with this, but it's how he pulls us in deep. Like, because I think there's no other way to pull us into deeper trials like this because some of these trials are nasty and they're not fun. They really clean us up. Like we said, he's cleaning up the um, original sin out of us and the, the lingering stuff that he needs rid of us f from before we do the um, final spiritual marriage, which again is another metaphor. So it's not like stage one engagement, stage two marriage. You know, It's not like that. It's just these... St. Teresa did an amazing way to explain the, the, the roadmap, so to speak, of uh, becoming one of these five virgins, the ten virgins, but only five made it in, right? Only five made it in the bridegroom. She's kind of giving us a roadmap here of what it looks like and the mystical experiences along the way. So that was the preamble I wanted to cover in her book of life. Chapter 29. Now let's dive into the six mansions because, remember, she's writing the six mansions, chapter 2, in retrospect to what she wrote in life because life was now in the hands of the Inquisitors at this time. So she's writing a lot of this in third person. So the six mansions, chapter 2, correlates back to her autobiography life, chapter 29. So wounds of love and more intense trials. So chapter 2 treats of several ways whereby our Lord quickens the soul there appears no cause for alarm in them, although they are signal favors of a very exalted nature. It seems as if we had deserted the little dove for a long time. Remember, little dove was the soul, right? She, I think she explained that back, it was in Fourth Mansions? But this is not the case. For these past trials cause her to take a far higher flight. I will now describe the way in which the spouse treats her before uniting her entirely to himself. He increases her longing for him by devices so delicate that the soul itself cannot discern them. Nor do I think I could explain them except to people who have personally experienced them. Yeah, these are very hard to describe. That's why I describe it's kind of like a, <laughs> it's kind of like a, a, I don't want to say a dull heartburn, like a, a dull oppression or sorry, not even depression. It's not an oppression. It's a dull depression on the heart, and it, it feels like it, you feel it physically. And you're you're just lovesick about Jesus. Where are you? I'm, I need to talk to you. You know, like where, you know, he's right there with us. But like she said, they're hard to describe. These desires are delicate and subtle impulses springing from the inmost depths of the soul. I know nothing to which they can be compared. Okay, paragraph two. These graces differ entirely from anything we ourselves can gain, and even from the spiritual consolation before described. In the present case. Even when the mind is not recollected, remember, recollection is practicing his presence. So it could either be done acquired recollection, which we, go out, we, we do the phone dialing, practice presence, or it's infused where he comes and does it. And that's what he does with the wound of love. So let's get back to this. Or even thinking of God, although no sound is heard, his majesty arouses it suddenly as if by a swiftly flashing comet or by a clap of thunder. So what she's saying here, 
This is a mystical recollection. It jumps in and it just comes in like a clap of thunder, right? That's her, that's her analogy, right? And it comes in suddenly. There you are, you know, just, I don't know, washing dishes or something or doing something and then boom, Jesus is in there. You can feel him. Yet the soul, thus called by God, hears him well enough, so well indeed, that sometimes, especially at first, it trembles and even cries out. Although it feels no pain, it is conscious of having received a delicious wound, but cannot discover how, nor who gave it, yet recognize it as a most precious grace and hopes the hurt will never heal. Again, these are her analogies, right? It's just... When he leaves, it, you feel it's it's. She has a certitude that Jesus came in and left, right? Came in and left, but she feels like it's a, it's a wound, right? But the the whole body has it. Like I said, it's that weird. You can feel it in the body. It's like a physical manifestation from it. And a lot of times, it's the mind too, where he penetrated so deep in the soul. It's like there's no way to describe that. How do you, how do you, what are words you use to describe that something penetrated deep into your soul, in your heart? There are no words. That's how you know it's him. Paragraph three, the soul makes amorous complaints to its bridegroom. Again, the analogy back to Matthew and the, the ten, 10 virgins. Even uttering them aloud, nor can it control itself, knowing that though he is present, he will not manifest himself so that you may enjoy him. Right? As I said, that's that weird feeling. You walk around like, God, I need you. God, I need you. I'm like, oh, I'm right here. You're here. I'm right here. You know, but it's not like usual where you feel, you feel the, the connection one-to-one. -one. It's just like, he feels like he's not there, but he's there. It's very weird. <laughs> so how does she describe that again? Knowing that though he is present, he will not manifest himself that you may enjoy him. That makes sense? He's indwelling and he's there because you can just sense it. Oh, you're right there. But it's not like the usual one. You feel his presence with you as you go about. It's, it's really strange. Okay, I digress. This causes a pain keen, although sweet, and delicious from which the soul cannot escape, even if it wished. But this it never desires. This favor is more delightful than the pleasing absorption of the faculties in the prayer of quiet, which is accompanied by suffering. Remember, prayer of quiet from the fifth mansions. So paragraph four. I am at my wit's end, sisters, as to how to make you understand this operation of love. I know not how to do so. It seems contradictory to say that the beloved clearly shows he dwells in his soul and calls by so unmistakable a sign and summons so penetrating that the spirit cannot choose but hear it. It's true. While he appears to reside in the seventh mansion, he speaks in this manner, which is not set form of speech, and the inhabitants of the other mansions, the senses, the imagination, the faculties, dare not stir. So here she's saying, so... When he pulls away, she's using her analogy, right? So we're in the six mansions now. Jesus is still inside us, but he pulls into the seventh mansion, right? The center, the center of her mansion, where he's calling us, pulling us in deeper. Why? Because he dwells there. We dwell in our soul, but he want and he dwells in our soul too, in our spirit, but he wants us to pull us into where he dwells, right? That's the full union, that's the marriage. So in the other mansions, and the inhabitants of the other mansions are what? The senses. The imagination and the faculties dare not stir. So I have some notes here from this one. It's from Life, chapter 15, paragraph 1. Let us now go back to the subject. This quiet and recollection of the soul makes itself in great measure felt in the satisfaction and peace. She's talking about the prayer of quiet. Attended with very great joy and response of faculties and most sweet delight. Wherein the soul is established, it thinks because it's not gone beyond it, that there is nothing further to wish for but that its abode might be there and would willingly say so with St. Peter. So what she's saying, so in the fifth mansions, there's the, the prayer of quiet, right? This quiet and recollection going on. And the soul goes, wow, we've made it. This is this is the pinnacle. This is the top. We're made to the top of the mountain. And she's saying, no, it's not. There's an intermediary mansion, the sixth mansion, and then finally the seventh mansion. So you're in the fifth with the prayer of quiet. And so what does God do? He comes in and he gives you this, this, this longing, this lovesickness, that pulls you into where he lives. Paragraph 5. O Almighty God, how profound are thy secrets and how different are spiritual matters from anything that can be seen or heard in this world. I can find nothing to which liken these graces. Insignificant as they are compared with many others, thou dost bestow on souls. 
This favor acts so strongly upon the spirit that is consumed by desires yet knows not what to ask, for it realizes clearly that God is with it. So you say that it, it comes in so strongly, this favor acts so strongly upon the spirit that is consumed by desires yet knows not what to ask for. It's lovesick, right? For it realizes clearly that it is with God is with it. it. Doesn't know what to do. It's just like, wow, what's going on here? I don't know what to ask for. I'm totally in the presence of God and I'm just loving it. I'm just loving it in this place right here. Again, these experiences are subtle. This isn't like, I got totally wrecked today when God came in. It's nothing like that. That's a very uh, chris charismatic thing. We're talking more mystical. In mystical, the experiences are subtle. So you may inquire if it realizes this so clearly, what more does it desire and why is it so pained? What greater good can it seek? I cannot tell. I know that the suffering seems to pierce the very heart, and when he who wounded it draws out the dart, he seems to draw the heart out too. So deep is the love it feels. Right? She's going back to this, this cool poetic stuff. Uh, basically, I guess she's explaining being lovesick. She's lovesick for Jesus. And he's, she's in the six mansions, and he's, she can see him and feel him. That he's kind of like over in the seventh mansions, kind of just, come on in, come on in. She goes like, you can't get there yet. I need, you know. So paragraph six. I've been thinking that God might be likened to a burning furnace from which a small spark flies into soul that feels the heat of this great fire, which, however, is insufficient to consume it. The sensation is so delightful, the spirit lingers in the pain produced by its contact. It seems to me to be the best comparison I can find for the pain is delicious and is not really pain at all, nor does it always continue in the same degree. Sometimes it lasts for a long time, on other occasions it passes quickly. This is as God chooses, for no human means can obtain it. Though felt at times for a long while, yet it is intermittent. So the lingering effects can be for a while. Like I said, like if you're going through a trial, I've had some lingering effects last for months. Right? Oh God, I need you. I need you, right? I'm going through this trial right now. And like, I'm right here. I'm right here in the seventh mansion, waving from his little, you know, this crystal abode in there. And when he pops in like this, it's intermittent, you know, and goes. It's just helping us to pull us along. I keep mentioning trial. I know she can get that too, because there's trials associated with these. And that's where God does the cleaning, ripping out the original sin or ripping out the whatever is left in us of behaviors. I need to be changed for us for the, to be one of the, the, the five virgins that are let in. Chapter 7. In fact, it is never permanent and therefore does not wholly inflame the spirit. But when the soul is ready to take fire, the little spark suddenly dies out, leaving the heart longing to suffer anew its loving pangs. Wow, there it is right there. No grounds exist for thinking this comes from any natural cause or from melancholy or that is an illusion of the devil or the imagination. Undoubtedly, this movement of the heart comes from God, who is unchangeable, nor do its effects is resemble those of other, of other devotions in which the strong absorption of delight makes us doubt the reality. Paragraph 8. There is no suspension here of the senses or the faculties. They wonder at what is happening without impeding it, nor do I think they can either increase or dispel this delightful pain. Anyone who has received this favor from our Lord will understand my meaning on reading this. Let her thank him fervently. There is no need to fear deception, but far more fear of not being sufficiently grateful for so signal a grace. Let her endeavor to serve him and to amend her life in every respect. Then she will see what will follow and how she will obtain still higher and higher gifts. So see what she said there? Let her endeavor to serve him and amend her life in every respect. That's where God's doing the work on us deep inside our soul and our spirit and our heart. Paragraph 9. A person on whom this grace was bestowed passed several years without receiving any other favor, yet was perfectly satisfied. For even had she served God for many years in the midst of severe trials, she would have felt abundantly repaid, but he may be forever blessed. Amen. She made some interesting, interesting points here. When you're at this place and you're in that spiritual engagement or betrothal with Jesus, your mystical experiences may be few and far between. And your only mystical experiences may be this wound of love. 
keeps dragging you along. You know, like I said, I, I, I was a pastor um, of Night Strike for years, you know, after I took over from Bob Johnson. And the ex- spiritual experiences were off the hook there. They were incredible. But that season of my life has changed, and I still long for and like, oh my gosh, I love to have those. But that's not where I'm at right now because as awesome as those experiences were, I don't need them now where I'm at with Jesus. If that makes sense. So I would love to have those, some of those experiences on the streets again. They were just crazy and insane, but I don't need those now where I'm at with him. What if no other miracle ever happened when you turn away from Jesus? So now it's about not about seeing him and his miracles like we did in early on, you know, with the, the the dating portion, right? We first met and they're dating. That's that's why I call it Night Strike. Although I was in a church for 47 years, I finally met Jesus on the streets of the homeless ministry. I finally met him there. And those things are cool. I love, I'm so blessed to have been a part of that. And I, I, I can't believe Jesus would let me, you know, pull me into that. Let me see those sort of things. They're off the hook, but... I don't need that to go on now. In fact, a lot of the exorcism stuff seems to be winding down too, which is good because I think it took a toll on me a lot. Um, I think Jesus prepared me for new things. I'm still doing exorcisms, but I don't do as many as I did before. I turned down a lot of things because a lot of times I, Jesus told me, this person's going through a trial. It's not deliverance. So I also told Jesus too, and I'm at this point now, you know, if this stuff disappeared forever, I just it'd be okay just to be with you. I'm, I'm, I'm at a point now, it's okay just to teach about you. It's all right. Because that's where relationships at. It's about who Jesus is and surrendering less and less of what I need from him just so we could have that relationship and be one on one and join wills. You know, it's just that's more of a spiritual maturity. I think a lot of these pastors and all these churches miss this, what's going on. I see a lot of pastors out there on Instagram who don't really have a relationship because they're preaching it. A lot of them are chasing the likes. A lot of them are chasing, you know, thinking they're doing a thing for God. They're not doing anything for God. God doesn't need their Instagram. God doesn't need Mike to do exorcisms. What he needs is Mike. What he needs is that pastor. Just one-on-one. That's what he needs. He wants a family. And that's what we're talking about here. How do you become a member of the family? So, I digress again. (laughs) Let's go to paragraph 10. Perhaps you wonder why we may feel more secure against deception concerning this favor than in other cases. I think it is for these reasons. Firstly, because the devil cannot give such delicious pain. Right? It's This is a total act of love. You know, it's just nothing's on your mind but Jesus. Like, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it's not an obsession. It's not like, you know, early on when you first meet Jesus, you do have, you do have this obsession. Like, you want to preach to everybody. Like, uh, let me show you what Jesus did. That's great and all. We're supposed to have that. But now as you pull him into a family members and these intimacies, it's just, it's got to be him one-on-one. So let's get back to this. He may cause pleasure, delight, which appears spiritual, but is unable to add suffering, especially suffering so keen, a sort. United to peace and joy of soul, his power is limited to what is external. Suffering produced by him is never accompanied with peace, but with anxieties and struggles. He's cleaning us up. It's a trial. Paragraph 11. Secondly, because this welcome storm comes from no region over which Satan has control. Thirdly, because of the great benefits left in the soul, which, as a rule, is resolute to suffer for God and longs to bear many crosses. It is also far more determined than before to withdraw from worldly pleasures and intercourse and other things of the same sort. Paragraph 12. It is very clear that there is no fiction. The imagination may counterfeit some favors, but not this, which is to manifest to leave room for doubt. Shall any one still remain uncertain? Let her know that hers were not genuine impulses. So there's a certitude comes with a certainty. Yeah, oh my God, that was from God. Usually with intellectual visions, like she's talking about in some of these cases when she experienced these, we are given the certainty it was God without even having the ability to see it either through a corporal vision or imaginative vision. And it strikes us so deep in the heart and the soul that it's places you can't reach. It's only 
The only place God has keys and access to. And that's what gives us certitude. That's him. Like, oh my God, that was just Jesus. That was incredible. A lot of times, like I said, so subtle, you don't realize till afterwards. You know, it's not a great religious experience. Like, oh my gosh, oh good. But here she had such a discernment of the Holy Spirit coming in. She felt it. It will be cool to have that discernment. I do. But not to this extent where it's so deep, like she discerns it right away. Sometimes I, unless she doesn't tell us, but a lot of times I feel like it's coming on. Or, you know, it's already been going on for a while, and then it, it's done. Or I caught it right away. Like, wait a minute, that was just the Holy Spirit. You know, it's just, it's how you capture these things. And you have, like she said, if you're uncertain about it, then it wasn't a genuine impulse. It wasn't that. Let's continue. That is, if she is dubious as to whether or not she experienced them, for they are certainly perceived by the soul as is a loud voice by the ears. It is impossible for these experiences to proceed from melancholy whose whims arise and exist only in their imagination. Whereas this emotion comes from the interior of the soul. Paragraph 13. I may be mistaken, but I shall not change my opinion until I hear reasons to the contrary from those who understand these matters. I know someone who has already greatly dreaded such deceptions, yet could never bring herself to feel any alarm about this state of prayer. Again, she's talking to third person. She goes, that's her signature right there. Oh, by the way, I had this. <laughs> this is coming straight up for me in the third person. Paragraph 14. O oh Lord, also use other means of rousing the soul. For instance, when reciting vocal prayer without seeking to penetrate the sense, a person may be seized with a delightful fervor, as if suddenly encompassed with a fragrance powerful enough to diffuse itself through all senses. I do not assert that there really is any perfume, but use this comparison because it somewhat resembles the manner by which the spouse makes his presence understood, moving the soul to a delicious desire of enjoying him and thus disposing it to heroic acts and causing it to render him fervent praise. Paragraph 15. This favor springs from the source as the former, but causes no suffering here nor are the souls longing to enjoy God painful. This is what is more usually experienced by the soul. For the reasons already given by there appears no cause here to fear, but rather receiving it with thanksgiving. Yes, yeah, some people may, after experiencing it, think, God left them. <laughs> I need deliverance. You know, it's just because we're not taught. We're not given spiritual direction from the pulpit anymore. Yeah, it's good to read straight up from the Bible. It's also good to teach people how to pray because I, I know from counseling, and I don't want to get my soapbox here, a lot of people in church don't know how to pray. They don't. They don't know how to hear from God. That's, that's horrible. So let's wrap up the Interior Castles, Six Mansions, Chapter 2. And of course, we got to do some spiritual exercises. Acquired recollection. Practicing His presence. So what is practicing His presence? If you're just joining in here, practicing his presence, or what Teresa called acquired recollection, was just stilling your mind, Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Just calm your senses. It's not purging. It's not Zen Buddhism. We're not purging. We are relaxing, and we're just telling the brain just to be quiet. It's okay to be quiet. We don't need to think if we left the oven on, or we're cooking cookies, or we're, they're burning, or something like that. Get them out of the oven before you start this. Or, you know, do I have an Excel spreadsheet due at lunchtime? You know, shut that down too. We don't need to worry about that right now. It's just stilling the mind so there's nothing but you and Jesus. Spiritual exercises. We're going to do Teresa and Recollection. Here we go. Still your mind, Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I'm God. I'm just going to relax and still the mind. Shut things down. Listen to the voice. Give me the grace to recollect myself in the little heaven of my soul where you've established your dwelling. There, you let me find you. There I feel you are closer to me than anywhere else. And there, you prepare my understanding that all things of the world are but toys. Seems all of a sudden to rise above everything created and escape it. So if anything's coming into the mind now of stuff or chores you need to do today, just 
Let him go. Just let it go and let the mind be still. Find peace and relax. My God, if I could only recall often that you are dwelling within my soul, I think that it would be impossible for me to give myself up to the things of the world. For compared with what I have within me, they seem to me to have no value at all. Help me, O oh Lord, to withdraw my senses from exterior things, make them docile to the commands of my will, so that when I want to converse with you, they'll retire at once, like bees shutting themselves up in the hive in order to make honey. Let's relax and just be at peace right now. Can I feel Jesus right now? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. It's okay. We just want to still the mind. Just let Jesus there. Let Jesus in. Can you imagine Jesus in your mind right now? Can you imagine him? See Jesus. As your mind's being still, see Jesus. Look at his face. How does he see you? How does Jesus look at you when you look at him? Just look at his face. And we know that he absolutely loves you. He absolutely loves you and he dwells inside you. That's the Jesus that dwells inside you. Maybe you just want to spend a moment with him there. Yeah, have personal time with him. And just feel his peace and how much he loves you. For God so loved the world, he gave you Jesus. Jesus suffered for you. He went through many horrible things for you because that's the greatest act of love that anyone, anyone could ever give throughout history. Nobody's even come close to matching it for you. Jesus absolutely loves you. Now, if you want to stay longer in this and just Go ahead and hit the pause on this podcast right now. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and bring you in for a landing here. So Jesus, thank you so much for the encounter. We love you. you. We love all the things you've done for us, everything you've done for us. You are our creator. You are the master of the universe. You're the king of the kings, lord of lords. And all spiritual beings bow down to you. And we too are spiritual beings in flesh, and we bow down to you too. And we love you. We thank you that you're preparing us to be one of the five virgins that make it through the door. And we thank you for the trials. And we thank you for the, the wound of love that you give us that helps clean up the original sin so that we go dwell with you deeper inside of us to where you reside inside of us. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Now go ahead and just open your eyes now and Come back to what you were doing. We're just here in this present space and time listening to the podcast. Listening to some guy and M16 Ministries Tales of Glory podcast. Back in the reality of things. We thank Jesus for his presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. So in conclusion, next time we are diving into the Six Mansions, Chapter 3. We're going to be covering a lot of cool stuff here on visions. Corporal vision, imaginative vision, intellectual visions. 
diving in that John Paul Jackson stuff. You're going to see where he got all his material from. It came from Six Mansions, Chapter 3. That and the Bible, right? Those two fuse together because St. Teresa just pulls the stuff aside and explains what, you know, she, she gleans her stuff from the Bible, which is so cool. So, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this great information. Thank you for letting us communicate with you. Thank you for communicating with us. So like I always say, you know, like smash that walk button on your whatever podcast you're listening to, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Um, help us out and subscribe if you can, whatever things we have here. So um, this will be on a field guide to spiritualwarfare.blogspot.com is where we host the po- all the podcasts. So you can find out your podcast you want and select from there. And um, I'll have show notes on there too from, from some of the stuff today. Also, if we'd love some financial assistance, we're going some harsh times right now. But it's no big deal. God's gotten us through ones before, you know, this feast or famine. So if you'd like to help us out and bless us, you can go to PayPal and donate to m16ministries at gmail.com. And our books are available at www.afg2sw.com. Go ahead and check those out. You also get the books off the uh, the podcast site too. A field guide to spiritual warfare at blogspot.com. They're there, so feel free. Um, even I wrote the field guide to spiritual warfare back 2010. It's still the book I hand out to people who are going through hauntings and learning deliverance and stuff like that. It's it's still a good book. Yep, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. And that wraps up Saint Teresa of Avila, the Tura Castle, Six Mansions, Chapter Two. Love you guys. Be a blessing. Make good choices. And M16 Ministries, Reverend Mike, checking out. Amen.